Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome back. I'm Chris. This is Biographics. Was Franklin Pierce the saddest president of the United States? Um, I just did a video on the uh, Civil War, Revolutionary War, Civil War, um, and I was talking a little bit about Franklin Pierce. So I saw this video and I wanted to do it. Um, before we get started, you can click the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to help me out. That's fantastic. If you don't want to help me out, then don't do that. Um, you can click on the thanks button to donate to the channel. And you can request a video in your name sponsoring that video. You don't have to if you don't want to. Hey, times are tough. I'm not you know, getting mad at you. Um, you can still request a video. Just you know, leave it in the comments. Just takes a little bit longer to get to. Okay, let's get into Franklin Pierce. Biographics. I'm your host, Cons McCore, Madman Eric Malachite, and today we're talking about one of the worst presidents in history, and likely we have an accompanying poll where you can vote on whether or not he deserves that title above some other historical examples. Today's script was provided by the ever factual Larry Holsworth, so be sure to show the man some love in the comments and gear up for one of the saddest presidential stories you're likely to hear. Franklin Pierce, who pronounced his surname as Purse, is consistently ranked as one of the worst presidents in American history. His administration, which occurred in the decade preceding the American Civil War, is cited as one in which the causes of that war were exacerbated by the president's policies. Though a native of New Hampshire, Purse generated considerable enmity from his fellow New Englanders, largely due to his stand against the abolitionists that demanded an end to slavery. His political skills were unequal to the challenges he faced in office and his own Democratic Party refused to nominate him to run for a second term, an almost unheard of circumstance in American politics. His life was one of tragedy and melancholy. His wife's family disapproved of him. It took eight years of courting before she could be persuaded to marry him. Jane Means Appleton, who eventually became his wife, was deeply religious, hated politics, despised Washington, and opposed the consumption of alcohol to the point she was active in temperance movements in antebellum New England. Purse, on the other hand, and thrived in political and legal maneuvers, drank to excess, and served in several posts in Washington. His views on religion can be surmised by his refusal to take the oath of office as president by swearing on a Bible. He affirmed his oath with his hand on a law book. Franklin Pierce entered the presidency prone to bouts of depression, his wife having refused to accompany him to Washington. Throughout his four years in office, he drank to excess. His was a gloomy, unhappy White House. He may well have been one of the worst presidents in history. History. He may also have been the saddest, or at the very least, the unhappiest. Franklin Pierce's climb to the presidency included what would, in a much later day, become known as getting all of his tickets punched. His experience in politics began in the most democratic of all American forms of government, the New England Town Meeting. Eventually, he served in the New Hampshire State Legislature, where he rose to the position of Speaker of the House. Later, he served in the United States House of Representatives, and still later in the United States Senate. He served over a decade in the New Hampshire State Militia, reaching the rank of Colonel, and during the Mexican-American War, he held a commission as a brigadier general in the regular army, serving with distinction. By the time he came under consideration for the presidency, his resume was impressive, to say the least, but it did not begin that way. Franklin Pierce was born in 1804 in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. He was the fifth of what would be eight children born to tavern keeper and American Revolutionary War hero Benjamin Pierce and his wife Anna. According to family lore, Franklin was born in the log cabin then occupied by his parents and siblings. However, the large Pierce homestead in Hillsborough, which still stands, is advertised as his childhood home. Except for when he was away at school, the house was Franklin's home until his marriage in 1834. Pierce was a reluctant student in his youth, to say the least. Sent by his father to attend the town school in Hancock, some 12 miles distant, Franklin ran away, returning to the family homestead in Hillsborough. His father, by then a state legislature and prominent politician, forced him to return to school. Two of Franklin's elder brothers, both veterans of the War of 1812, counseled their younger sibling to focus on his studies, ignoring any pangs caused by being away from home. Franklin heeded their advice, eventually attending Phillips Exeter Academy in Andover and then enrolling in Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. While there, he befriended a young Nathaniel Hawthorne as well as other young men with whom he would later serve in Congress. After graduating from Bowdoin with a... There's a really good story about him going to school. I have a book. I didn't finish it. Sorry. 
Franklin Pierce um, signature series book, and he uh, he goes to school, and he decides he's going to quit, and so he comes home. I think he walks or something like that. Walks home, goes inside the house, and his mom and dad are there, you know, and they're like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just gave up on school. I'm done. And they were like, oh, okay. Well, here, have have some food. Sits down and eat, talking to his family. What are you going to do? What's this? What's that? And he's like, I don't know. And I'll figure it out. And they're like, cool. And his dad's like, let's go have a talk. So him and his dad get in a little carriage. They start going on along. His dad takes him all the way up to this, I'll call it like a stop, just a, a point where, you know, it's off the property. Stops and tells him to get out. Pierce is like, why? I, we have to walk back home? And he goes, no, no, no. You're, I'm, this is as far as I'm taking you. You're, you're going back to school. I paid for it. Uh, I don't expect to see you back here. And if you do quit, don't ever come back here. Hey. Bye, and just turns around, and gets in, his, you know, takes the carriage right on back home, and Franklin Pierce is like, oh, and walks back to school. But he said that was a lesson he learned the hard way. Like he can't quit. Bachelor of Arts degree, Franklin read the law under the guidance of attorney and former governor of New Hampshire Levi Woodbury in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He later attended law school in Northampton, Massachusetts, and passed the bar in New Hampshire in 1827. And then he established a legal practice in Hillsborough that year. In the meantime, Benjamin Peirce had continued to advance his own political career as a pro-Andrew Jackson Democrat. In March 1827... Uh, sorry about that. Roofing people. Benjamin was elected as governor of New Hampshire. His son Franklin likewise sought political office and won the position of moderator of Hillsborough's town meeting in the elections of 1828. He won the office again in the following five years. In 1829, Franklin also won election to the state legislature. Two years later, with the Democrats holding a clear majority in New Hampshire, Franklin Peirce was elected as Speaker of the State House of Representatives. He was 27 years of age and the rising star of New Hampshire politics. How and when Jane Appleton became acquainted with Franklin Peirce is disputed. One claim from family lore holds that Franklin introduced himself to Jane during a thunderstorm when he warned her against seeking shelter beneath a tree, an introduction by one of his Bowdoin professors in another version often cited. However, it actually happened, historians agree it was not welcomed by Jane's family, and that's probably an understatement. The Appletons were wealthy, politically connected, anti-slavery, and pro-temperance. Jane was well-educated, well-read, and possessed of musical talent. Refined and cultured, she was also deeply religious with puritanical leanings, which did little to alleviate her condemnation of demon rum. While she obviously found some attraction in the young Franklin Purse, her family did not share her enthusiasm. They found him coarse beneath her station of the wrong political bent, ill-mannered, and too prone to indulge in alcohol. Even worse, his epistemic Episcopalian leanings were anathema to their Calvinist beliefs. They also looked askance at his obvious political ambitions as being low-minded and uncultured. To the Appletons, Franklin Peirce came up well short of their ideal match for Jane. Franklin Peirce did not view his political ambitions as a personal quest for power and influence. Following the examples set by his father and others, he viewed public service through political office as a noble cause. Though he disagreed with the political views of the Appletons and others in New England, including the abolitionists, he did not view such disagreements as being exclusive of personal relationships. He continued to court Jane Appleton despite the growing disparity of views dividing American politics, especially the issues of slavery, its containment in the states in which it already existed, and its exclusion from new states seeking admission into the Union. Purse's growing influence in New Hampshire politics brought with it an elevation in social affairs as well. By 1832, his position as well as Jane's advancing age led her family to regard his courtship with, let's say, some more welcoming attitudes. Jane was by then 26 years of age, considered old to be unmarried in that time and place. That year, Franklin was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives as he neared the end of his term as Speaker of the House and the state legislature. Jane agreed to marry the politician and they were wed on November 
November 19th, 1834. Following their marriage, the new bride accompanied her husband to Washington and the boarding house where he lived while Congress was in session. Much has been made of Franklin Pierce's drinking, with some biographers expressing the belief that he enjoyed the bottle to excess for most of his adult life. Others have claimed that Pierce did not indulge in heavy drinking until later tragedies had overwhelmed him. That Jane that's that's one thing that I've heard. He did like to drink, but he didn't drink to get like drunk. You know, he wasn't a like a frat guy. Woo! Yeah, keep drinking. He wasn't one of those. He enjoyed drinking. He enjoyed the 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 casual sitting around with a bunch of people talking, drinking. Everyone's having fun. But he wasn't stumbling, stumbling out of places. It wasn't until later on when the, the drinking got really bad, understandably. But a teetotaler and temperance supporter agreed to marry him would seem to indicate she did not consider his drinking to be a serious problem, at least not at the time they were married. Or maybe she believed she could fix him. Whichever it may have been, it was not destined to be a happy marriage. Again, an understatement. In 1833, Franklin Pierce went from being the leader of the Democratic faction in the New Hampshire legislature to being a junior representative in the United States Congress. The Democrats held the majority in 1833, though Pierce on more than one occasion voted against party measures. He opposed using federal money to fund improvements in infrastructure, such as roads and canals, believing such efforts to be within the purview of the individual states. He also became a leading voice against the rising influence of the abolitionists in Congress, viewing them as agitators. Peirce defended the rights of the states over the power of the federal government regarding slavery, which he considered to be a legal issue of property rather than, you know, a moral issue of human rights. Peirce also opposed the religious caste of abolitionists, who decried the southern slave owners as sinners. To Peirce, such religious bigotry was abhorrent. He publicly condemned slavery as a social and political evil, expressing the wish that it had no existence on the face of the earth, but also expressed that the abolitionist movement must be crushed or that there is an end to the Union. Peirce was re-elected to the House in 1836. By then, he lived in Washington alone while Congress was in session. Jane had found the social scene in Washington to be unbearable. The manners and behavior in the city were repugnant to her New England sensibilities, and in 1835, she left the city to reside with her mother. She cited her failing health as an excuse to leave Washington. Franklin purchased a home in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, though she found that residence equally untenable during the periods when her husband was absent in Washington. On February 2nd, 1836, Jane gave birth to a son, the purses named Franklin Jr. The infant died three days later on February 5th. Both parents were thrust into deep melancholy. Franklin delved deeply into his work while Jane found continued residence in Hillsborough to be unthinkable. The couple purchased another home in Concord, New Hampshire in 1838. By then, Franklin was no longer sitting in the House of Representatives. In 1837, Franklin Purse had been elected to the United States Senate by the New Hampshire legislature. Franklin Pierce entered the U.S. Senate during emotionally trying times. His wife had not recovered from the loss of their son and had begun to complain of severe chronic health issues. Franklin's own mental well-being had been similarly affected, and among his cronies in Congress, he began to develop the reputation of being a heavy drinker, during an age when excessively heavy drinking, at least to modern eyes, was the norm. Nonetheless, he was considered an able senator, reliably supporting or opposing legislation along party lines. He also demonstrated an ability to bestow political patronage. In one example, he appointed his longtime friend Nathaniel Hawthorne as a custodian of coal and salt in the port of Boston. The position, ostensibly in the Boston Customs House, was what would later be known as a no-show job. The sinecure provided Hawthorne with an income, demanded little of his time, and supported the writer as he produced the short stories collected into the volume Twice Told Tales, his first major literary success. Meanwhile, Jane had come to the conclusion that the death of their infant son had been divine retribution for the sinful and profligate ways of her husband. Reinforced by relatives from her mother's family, Jane wrote her husband letters in which all of their woes were laid plainly at his feet punishment for his choice of career. To Jane, even her husband's drinking was an effect rather than a cause. She joined him in Washington, made some of the demanded social appearances, and soon fled back to her family. During her visits to Washington, she... All right, sorry about that. My uh, 
pup had to go outside. Okay, back to the video. She strongly encouraged her husband to exit politics. In 1839, Jane and Franklin Peirce welcomed a second son into the world, whom they named Frank Robert Peirce. Young Frank provided further motivation for Jane to convince her husband to enter another career. By late 1840, a presidential election year, Franklin had come to agree with his wife. The Democrats lost both the White House and the Senate majority in that year's election. Franklin was also term limited by New Hampshire law, meaning he could not run for re-election for another term as Senate senator at the end of his current term. By then, Jane and Franklin had another son, Benjamin Peirce, born April 13, 1841. The presence of two sons with Jane at the Concord home provided further inducement for Franklin to leave the Senate. Franklin Peirce resigned from the Senate in early 1842 and returned to the practice of law. I just want to point out, he's the only one who says Franklin Peirce, because that's what Franklin Pierce said, I have never heard that. So I'm not saying he's incorrect, but uh, Barbara Bush came from the Pierce family and she herself said it was the Pierce family. So say whatever you'd like, but I'm going to call him Franklin Pierce in Concord, New Hampshire. He had no intention of retiring from politics, as subsequent events demonstrated, though to his wife, he promised he would focus on the practice of law. In Concord, Franklin Peirce entered into a law practice which enhanced his reputation as a capable attorney while affording him the time to remain active in state political circles. Jane, meanwhile, enjoyed her status as the wife of a well-regarded lawyer and former senator. She became an active participant in Concord's social scene and entertained numerous notable guests in their home, including writers, legislators, educators, and other celebrated personages. For a very brief time, all was well in the Peirce household and marriage. Then, in a 1843, an epidemic of typhus swept through Concord. Before it was over, it had claimed the life of young Frank Robert Peirce at the age of four. Both Franklin and Jane were again stricken with the deep grief caused by the loss of a child. Jane took solace in prayer, penitence, and the presence of her sole surviving child. Franklin, however, sought relief from his pain through his work, party politics, and increasingly, the bottle. Franklin hired a married couple to attend to the household duties at Concord, freeing Jane of her domestic responsibilities and allowing her to spend all of her time with their surviving son, Benjamin. She devoted herself to her son completely, ignoring social invitations and activities and personally supervising his education in a strictly Puritan religious environment. Franklin Peirce had promised his wife he would not accept political office, and though he served as the chairman of the state's Democratic Committee, he refused the office of Attorney General when offered it by President James K. Polk. A military appointment, though, was another matter. In 1846, after Congress declared war on Mexico, Peirce accepted a commission as a colonel in the 9th Infantry Regiment of the United States Army. In early 1847, he was promoted to Brigadier General and sent to Veracruz under the command of General Winfield Scott. Peirce served with distinction in Mexico, and when he returned to Concord, he was greeted with a hero's welcome in late 1847, following the American victory in the Mexican War. He resumed his law practice, reassured his wife that he had no political ambition, and appeared for all intents and purposes to be content with his lot. In 1852, the Democratic Party prepared for the presidential election with a June convention in Baltimore, Maryland. The party was deeply divided, largely over the issue of slavery and its expansion into new states and territories. Among the candidates for the nomination for president were Sam Houston of Texas, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, and James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. Peirce remained in New Hampshire, far from the brokering and deal-making on the convention floor. Yet, he allowed his supporters in the party to enter his name as a candidate after several ballots failed to select a nominee. On the 49th ballot of the contentious gathering, Franklin Peirce acquired the needed votes to become the Democratic nominee for president. A subsequent ballot named William Rufus King as his running mate. Peirce received the news via a telegram to his Concord home. When Jane heard the news, she collapsed in a faint. Peirce's opponent was Winfield Scott, 
who had been his commanding officer in Mexico. Scott, though a celebrated war hero for his actions in Mexico, proved an unpopular presidential candidate. Franklin Pierce won the election handedly, achieving a majority of the popular vote and a landslide in the Electoral College. It was the peak of his political career. Before he was to enter what historians rank as one of the nation's worst presidential administrations, he was fated to suffer one more personal tragedy, from which neither he nor his wife would ever fully recover. In December 1852, Purse, Jane, and their son Benjamin, nicknamed Benny, spent the Christmas holidays with Jane's sister and her husband in Andover, Massachusetts. Jane's sister was married to John Aiken, a textiles manufacturer and a leading benefactor of Phillips Academy, where Benny was scheduled to enroll. The Purses were frequent guests of the Aikens, and the holidays were less tense than they may have been given Jane's displeasure over her husband's return to politics. On January 6, 1853, the Purse family departed Andover by train for the journey to Concord, where Jane and Franklin were to prepare for their journey to Washington and the White House. Benny, then 11 years old, was standing to get a better view out of a window when the train derailed just a few miles north of Andover. The car in which the purses rode went down an embankment, crushed by its own weight and the following cars. Benny was immediately entangled with a broken wood and iron, which mangled his body and nearly decapitated him. The grisly accident occurred directly in front of his parents, and Franklin was later further traumatized by the necessity of identifying his dead son's body. Benny's body was returned to the Aiken home in Andover, where a funeral service was held before the president-elect's son was conveyed to Concord for burial. Franklin Purse accompanied his son's body to Concord. Jane, unable to bear her grief, did not, remaining behind in Andover. Six weeks after the tragedy, Franklin Purse left Concord to journey to Washington and his inauguration as the 14th President of the United States. His wife accompanied him as far as Baltimore, where she remained as her husband took the oath of office. There were no inaugural balls, no celebration at the President's mansion. Despite the large crowd which swelled Washington to see the new President enter office, an air of gloom predominated. It would last for the rest of his presidency. There are... So many presidents who endured a tragedy going to or while at the presidency. Hold on. Um, you know, Andrew Jackson losing his wife beforehand. Um, now I'm just drawing blanks. And and presidents uh, um, having tragedy while president. It's uh, losing a child. I'll never be in that situation. But I can't imagine just what it would put you through. And so learning more about him and people saying he's a failed president. I just feel bad for him. You know, unfortunately, it's what he wanted. He wanted to be the president. But we all grieve differently. Um, and I think, unfortunately, this was a four-year span with a Democratic president did not help matters when it came to the civil war. It was just four years of, of nothing. And, um, I just feel bad for him for having to deal with that and his wife and the country, because the country basically had four years of a drunk, Jane Purse eventually joined her husband in Washington, though she never took much interest in the role of First Lady. For the rest of her life, she wore black. Interestingly, she summoned spiritualists to the White House in attempts to contact her dead son, and she wrote notes and letters addressed to him, describing the events of the day. To the Washington press, she became known as the Shadow in the White House. Eventually, the phrase came to refer to the Purse's administration, as Franklin's policies created more and more enemies. Purse's vice president, William Rufus King, took his oath of office while in Cuba, the only American vice president to be inaugurated while on foreign soil. He was there in an attempt to recover his health, having contracted tuberculosis. The attempt failed. 
King died at his home in Alabama on April 18th, 1853. His death removed Peirce's important political links with Southern Democrats. Peirce's policies and his own fervent anti-abolitionism destroyed his standing with Northern Democrats. Having lost the support of his own party, his wife, and his Southern allies, Peirce's administration was doomed to failure. By the last year of his administration, he was virtually in exile in the White House though a defiant one. His support of the Fugitive Slave Act and the Kansas-Nebraska Acts alienated what was left of the coalition which elected him. Kansas erupted in bloody violence, which the president was seemingly powerless to stop. The Democratic Party chose not to nominate him to run for a second term, and Peirce left the White House and politics in 1857. In retirement, Peirce continued to voice his opinions and became a staunch opponent of the Lincoln administration during the Civil War. Yet his was the proverbial voice in in the wilderness. With Jane, he traveled extensively, visiting his friend Nathaniel Hawthorne in Europe and writing for newspapers in England and the United States. He predicted the Civil War as well as the racial strife which was to follow, but his warnings went unheeded. His former political allies and foes regarded him as a crank and his drinking continued unabated. His alcoholism did not go unnoticed in the press either. Jane Peirce died in December 1863 after a long period of decline due to tuberculosis. Franklin Peirce lived in retirement in New Hampshire until he predictably succumbed to cirrhosis of the liver in October 1869. His health was extensively covered in the nation's newspapers, mostly of which noted his long career in public service culminated by a failed presidency. Unlike many other quote-unquote failed presidents such as John Adams and Harry Truman, his career has never been subjected to a favorable re-examination by historians. He remains widely regarded as one of the worst presidents in American history. His was a life of service, deeply checkered with personal and professional tragedy, which ultimately ended in failure. Truly the saddest of presidents. I hope you learned something today. Yeah. I mean, you have to do your job as the president. You're the president of the whole nation. You you can, you can mourn when you're done. And it's I it's I'm I'm armchair quarterbacking here. It's easy to say that. It's Unfortunately, as I said, we all grieve differently. And it got the best of him. Three children. He predicted the Civil War, which unfortunately was not a difficult thing to predict back then. With just how things were, were going. But anyways, a little misunderstood guy. Was he the worst president? He deserves to be on that on that list, yes. I'm just hoping that this is a little more understanding of why it doesn't ex his drinking, the loss of his child doesn't excuse some of the decisions that he made um, or the fact that his whole party went against him. Um, but losing his vice president was also another situation where there wasn't somebody who could step in and say, Hey, we can't do this. But anyways, I mean, that's, that's, that's Franklin Pierce. I uh, hope you enjoyed this, the, the video, but, you know, tell me what you think of him. Until next time, have a good day, have a good night.